Today what we're going to do is look back a couple thousand years at the first ever church and reflect on how the first ever church might shape the church that we're becoming. How does that sound, New City? So today we're going to do something uh, a little different, just want to keep things fresh and keep you on your toes. So if you're able, get on those toes. Let's stand up for the reading of God's word. Did I hear somebody grumble? Oh, jeez, man. You guys are getting too comfortable here. We, we stand at some level just to acknowledge um, the uniqueness of this word. Out of all the other words that are vying for our attention, there's something distinct about a word that comes from the Lord. So listen to the reading of, of God's word. Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. This is the reading of the Lord's word. You may be seated. I pray that we would be the type of people that hear God's word, treasure God's word, and then have the courage to lead or to follow after God's word. Now we're in this, we're in this series called The First Ever Church where we're looking at the first couple chapters of the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is really all about the spirit of God working through the church. And if you guys remember where it all started, it started with just 120 followers of Jesus. 120 followers of Jesus gathering on the day of Pentecost, which was like a major religious festival uh, amongst the Jewish people. And on this day, something significant happens. God the Father and God the Son send God the Holy Spirit to dwell inside the life of every single believer. Again, in the big story of God, this is a very significant moment. And in this moment, the text says, as the Spirit enables, he gives the first church the gift to be able to speak in these different languages. And they're speaking in different languages because on the day of Pentecost, there's all these different people from different cultures and nations. They're, they're gathered together in Jerusalem on Pentecost, and now they're hearing the story of Jesus in their own language. What a scene, quite the scene. And we saw last week, uh, in this moment, there are some people that are really intrigued by this scene, all these different languages being declared. And then there are some, some people that are more antagonistic, they're a little distant. And we even thought about how we might step into a moment like that. When we were, in, if there's people that are interested in Jesus, how might we would respond? If there's people antagonistic towards the story of Jesus, how might we respond? And we saw how Peter responded. He responded by stepping into this moment and delivering the first ever sermon carried by the Holy Spirit. Peter was unapologetically all about Jesus. And Peter was dependent on a movement of the Holy Spirit. And what happened? Something miraculous. 3,000 people were cut to the heart convicted of their sin, and looked to Jesus in faith as their Lord and Messiah. Did you hear that? 120 to 3,000. Only God could do that. Only God could do that. Now, I don't know all that God has in store for this church. I just know I want to see more and more moments where all of us are like, only God could do that where it's very clear it's not about anybody in this room, but it's about God doing something really, really significant. I'm praying for moments like that. And now we just look at this text, 
If you've been in and around the church for a while, uh, maybe this is the text that you're overly familiar with. But we look at this text, and now we're peering into the first ever church. We're seeing what their life together was really like. We're, we're seeing what a spirit-enabled community really looks like. Now, maybe you're here and you're not sure about Jesus, and you're definitely not sure about organized religion. We're so glad you're here. But today is a great day for you because you get to hear all these stories of how we sense God is still working in this world, and you get to look at a text. I know the church isn't perfect. I know we're not perfect. But you get to look at a text and see what the church could be. Now, as I was reading this text and rereading this text for the last couple weeks, I kept coming back to one particular verse, verse 47. And verse 47 says this, Enjoying the favor of all the people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I just kept coming back to that verse, kept coming back to that verse. And kept asking myself, what did the first ever church do so that they had favor with everyone? Because it doesn't seem like the church today has much favor with the world around us. So what did they do? How did they live so that they gained favor? And how did this favor lead to explosive growth? More and more people finding and following Jesus. So that's the question we're going to ask today and we're going to go after what does it look like for the church to find favor with the world? And how can God use that favor to lead to more and more people finding and following Jesus? So my first kind of like insight or point that I want to draw your attention to as we look at the first ever church is that the first ever church was a caring and a sharing community. It sounds like a riddle our kindergartners might need to learn, but something maybe we need to learn as well. They were a caring and sharing community. Look at verse 44 and 45. All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. I want you to see, I want us to see, that the first ever church saw the needs of others. This doesn't seem to be a community where they just gathered together for 90 minutes on Sunday and then ran their separate directions. It seems like they spent real time with one another. Like there were people who ate together and laughed together. They prayed together and cried together. And as they spent more and more time with one another, they became vulnerable with one another. I loved hearing Brittany Ray's story. Like this just very honest, like I knew there was this longing in my heart for real community. But even as I showed up, there was still this hesitation. Like, is this a safe place? But I think as she became more and more comfortable and we built trust with her, she opened herself to this community and now she's highlighting and she's testifying to real people here at this church that has shown up and met her needs. See, as we move beyond the weather and the local sports scores and your favorite restaurants to eat in Oakland, we can start to see the needs of the people that are sitting right next to you. So my question for us is that in this very fast-paced culture, are you slowing down to see the needs of others? Or in this digitally connected world, are you connected in deeper ways to real people in this community? Or maybe a more direct way, if I'm able to ask, do you just show up to this community, have your needs met? Or do you show up to this community ready to how God might use you to meet the needs of others. The text says that they didn't just see the needs, but they also met the needs. The text highlights that they sold their properties and gave to anyone who had need. Now, we've talked a little bit through this series about the difference between a descriptive text and a prescriptive text. Like here, we're just peering into the life of the first church. The takeaway is not that we all need to sell everything and give everything away. But as we peer into the life of the first ever church, we do see that they were a sacrificial community. We do see that they were a generous community. They saw the stuff that God had given them as stuff they were called to steward and manage for the glory of God rather than cling to and hoard for themselves. Sometimes I like kind of going throughout church history and seeing how 
the church has responded or engaged with some of these topics that we're thinking through today. One of the pastor theologians that I've looked to uh, for the last couple of years is Basil the Great, this fourth century pastor theologian. And listen to what he says. This is convicting to me. I don't know about you. But he says this, the bread in your cupboard belongs to the hungry. The coat hanging unused in your closet belongs to the one who needs it. The shoes rotting in your closet, he is talking to Gabe Garcia right here. The shoes, the fifth pair of shoes you have, Garcia, belongs to the one who has no shoes. The money which you hoard up belongs to the poor. Now, what causes somebody to let go of their stuff for the good of others? I sure hope it's not guilt. And the last thing I ever want to do is to guilt you to do something. I think what causes the first ever church to be a caring and a sharing community, a sacrificial and a generous community, are the realities of the gospel. I think the more they understand who God is and what God has done through his son Jesus, I think it produces this transformation in this community. See, the more we reflect on how good God is, that God the Father let go and gave up his son, for our good, for our benefit. We sure don't deserve that. The more we reflect on the son being sacrificial and giving up his life to the point of death on a cross for our good and for our benefit, the more those truths become realities that are transforming our head, heart, our lives, they begin to produce this effect in us We become this joy-filled community that sees letting go of stuff as something that actually brings us joy, purpose, and contentment. It's why John could say this, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? I didn't write that. John did. John's an apostle. He's a follower of Jesus. But what does John do? He starts with the love of God. If the love of God is really inside you and changing you and transforming you, it's going to produce something in you. It's going to produce an effect to where you're looking to the needs of others, you're seeing those needs, and you're meeting those needs. See, when we become a community that can see and meet needs, I think it becomes beautiful and attractive to a watching world. And I think many of us in this community are already doing that. But what if all of us, over the next couple weeks, couple months, we became more attuned to the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit might lead us to seeing and meeting real needs in this community? Because I just have a sense that as we move to this new venue, we move to a new time, God's going to give us new gospel opportunities. We're going to engage with new people What if more and more of us were attuned to the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit might lead us to seeing and meeting those needs? When we do that, I think there's people outside peering in and saying, I don't know about this Jesus thing. I don't know about this church thing, but there's something beautiful and attractive about what's going on over there. If the first ever church gained favor with the outside world, I think it's in part because they were sacrificial and generous. The next point that I want to draw your attention to is this, the first ever church shared an authentic life together. Acts 2.46 says this, they broke bread or they ate tacos in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. We talked about the theology of party when we looked at the life of Jesus. Jesus was the type of guy that showed up to a wedding and was ready to party for seven days. And when that party ran out of wine, Jesus was the type of guy who performed a miracle to display his glory and to bring gallons and gallons of the highest quality wine to that party. Jesus was the type of guy that ate and dined with the most unlikely people, sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. And it seems that the first ever church carried on this principle, really the principle or the value of hospitality. Gospel hospitality should be something that all of us are are thinking about because hospitality is built into the very fabric of the Christian faith. 
And when I say it's built into the fabric of the Christian faith, it's because Jesus has welcomed each and every one of us, not just to a party, but to meaningful relationship with him. Maybe some of us just need to be reminded of of that. That if Jesus was here in the flesh, he would say, come over here, come eat with me. Come dine with me, come walk with me, come follow me. See, hospitality isn't about wowing people with your color schemes. It's about being open and inviting people into meaningful relationship. Again, the gospel brings about this effect, not guilt from Pastor Gabe. Romans 15, 7 says this, therefore welcome one another because Pastor Gabe is guilting you all day. Therefore welcome one another just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Be the most hospitable and welcoming people because God the Son says, come into relationship with me. Come dine with me. Come eat with me. Come celebrate with me. Come and be with me. Now, when we're a people that are resting in the hospitality of Jesus, I just think it transforms us to be the most welcoming and hospitable people possible. How might God be calling you to work out this hospitality muscle? As we make this move as a church, how might we welcome people to find and follow Jesus with us? Or in this next season as a church, how do we not just welcome people to Sundays at New City, but welcome people into our very lives? One of the things I'm really excited about uh, for our new venue, the new community we're in, it's just got a lot of different fun places to Uh, grab food, grab coffee before or after service. Like there's a great coffee shop a block away. There's a great taco truck a block away. There's different pho restaurants. There's hipster brunch restaurants. Did you hear me say there's a taco truck a block away? I met somebody from our church there this week. We walked around the lake. We ate tacos. It's beautiful. And I'm just imagining we're going to meet new people over the next couple weeks. And what if we were the type of church that says, hey, lunch is on me. Like, come have a taco with me and my family. Or what if we have the type of church that says, hey, I packed a lunch, we're going to go to the lake and have a picnic, and I packed an extra sandwich just in case I might meet someone like you. That's the type of gospel hospitality that, again, becomes really, really attractive, I think, to a watching world. Because we know this world is starving for authentic relationships. We know loneliness is a national epidemic. We know technology is advancing, but nothing replaces face-to-face communion. So when unlikely people and diverse people gather together to eat, to have fun, to pray, and to grow together, I think it's attractive. Again, we've been giving you hopefully very practical ways that you can partner with us in this journey. You just heard Carrie and I talk about it, pray, serve, invite, and give. I want you to think about invitation as the first step to hospitality. Come, have a meal with me. Come to, you hear me talking about my church, come to my church's grand opening. Stay afterwards, we're grabbing lunch. We're gonna go for a hike. Invitation is the first step towards hospitality. Communicates to somebody that I see you and I want relationship with you. My best friend from sixth grade drove through town yesterday. Not too many people are lucky enough to say they have a best friend from sixth grade. And he drove through Oakland. He met us. He was just in town for a couple hours. He met us at my son's football game, took the family out to lunch. And I love being able to connect with him for a couple hours, but I so love just seeing him with my kids, um, just engaging with them and laughing with them and just getting to know them a little bit. But as I was thinking about our relationship over the last lot of years, I'm not going to tell you how many years, just a lot of years, I was just thinking about all the ways he invited me. He invited me over his home to play basketball. He invited me to stay afterwards for dinner. He invited me to his youth group. He invited me to the campus ministry. He invited me to read good books about Jesus. Don't minimize the power of an invitation. An invitation can literally change and transform someone's life. Invitation is the first step to hospitality. My last little note here today is this. The first ever church was was God-focused. And I just love this one. 
If I haven't been preaching yet, I'm going to start preaching right now. (laughs) We see this in that they were committed to the teachings of Jesus, the apostles' teaching, which really isn't about the apostles, but it's about the message of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. We see it in their commitment to prayer earlier in the text, and we see it in verse 47. Verse 47 says, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the community. The, this wasn't a community that downplayed their God-centeredness. This was a worshiping community. This wasn't a community that was embarrassed by sometimes the weird elements of the Christian faith. This was a community that was running after God. Karen and I have been almost married for 18 years, which means I have long been a distance from the dating scene, thank goodness. But as I look back, I remember there's, as you're trying to pursue someone and engage someone, you want to play it cool. You want to let people know that, hey, I'm interested, but I'm not that interested. Like, I got other options. I like you, but I don't like you that much. It's the song and dance we play, and I'm so glad I'm done with it. But I think sometimes that's how we feel like we're going to connect with the watching world as we talk about our relationship with God. Like, I like Jesus, but I'm not, like, crazy about Jesus, I I, I like God, but I'm not one of those crazy Christians. I think there's more and more people in our world that are actually longing for a connection with the transcendent. And for those people, I think it's more attractive when they look inside our community and see people that are serious about the business of God. Uh, The Barnett Research Institute recently did a study that talked about the spiritual openness of our culture today. And listen to what they said. They said 80% of Americans say they think there is a spiritual or supernatural dimension in the world. 11% say they don't uh, they don't think such a dimension exists, but it is possible. Meanwhile, only 9% say they do not believe it exists. 91% of people in our country are open to the idea of a spiritual realm. The last thing they need from us is to be embarrassed by our belief and love and passion for God. As we look at this text, I love their their inclusive spirit. They wanted more and more people to join their community, but there wasn't a confusion about what they were joining. This wasn't just a community, a community club of fun activities and service projects. They were joining a community that was committed to the triune God a community that was unapologetically all about Jesus, a community that was dependent on a movement of the Holy Spirit, and a community of people that directed their lives vertically, upward, for the glory and the praise of God. As I think about New City Church, I love some of the things we're doing. I love that we're serving our city. I love that we're going on hikes and having meals together. This is part of what it means to be the church. That's why I think this church is attractive and compelling But may we never lose our seriousness about knowing God, enjoying God, and bringing glory to God in all that we do. Whatever my Bible reading plan is, um, I always have kind of one foot. I have a bookmark in the Psalms. And there's days I, I so mess up and skip and miss my Bible reading plan. But I love being in the Psalms. The Psalms are just poems and songs and prayers that have been collected uh, over the years and the church has feasted on for thousands of years. But I look at the Psalms and I see the seriousness in which the psalmists talk about their pursuit and their love and their passion for God. Let me just share a few of them. Psalm 42.1, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. We need more men praying that prayer. Psalm 63, 1, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land, I think Brittany Ray was talking about the dry and parched land where there is no water. Psalm 27, 4, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze at the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Again, I believe part of the reason the first ever church had favor is because they looked inside 
and they saw a people that were serious about God. I pray our reputation as a church, by God's grace, is yes, we're gathering together and eating together. They're really doing life together. Man, it seems like they're always out in the community doing good deeds, looking to serve and bless others. I love all of that. But man, they are serious about God. I hope that's true, by God's grace, of this church. As we continue to grow and mature, that the Spirit of God works inside each and every one of us to have a greater longing to know him, enjoy him, and bring glory to him. I think these are some of the reasons the first ever church had favor with all the people. The surrounding community, they were open, they were interested, they were intrigued. Why? Because the first ever church made following Jesus look believable, look attractive, look look compelling. On the other hand, the church can, and the church historically has given the world plenty of reasons to run the other direction. Anytime there's a moral failure, anytime there's an egregious mismanagement of money, anytime uh, gossip and slander takes root in the life of a church, anytime a church is is, is person-centered, man-centered, rather than God-centered, I think the world smells that out and wants to run the other direction. But when the gospel, when the gospel takes root in the life of the church, when the people of God are dwelling on the truths and the promises of God's grace to us in Jesus Christ, it begins to change and transform all of us. Gabe doesn't transform anybody. God does. And the Spirit of God wants to take the gospel and run it deep into our soul. And when that happens, we become more generous. Just as Christ has been generous to us. When that happens, we become more welcoming. Just as Christ has welcomed us. When that happens, we become more serious about the business of God. Just as Christ was serious about following the Father's will all the way to the cross. And when that happens, again, I think it becomes attractive and compelling. And this is why I believe the first ever church gained favor with the world. The gospel was transforming them from the inside out. They lived attractive lives. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There was just more and more people that were looking in and said, I want that. I pray that there'd be more and more people that are looking into this community and just say, I want what they have. And if it can happen in the first ever church, there is no reason, there's no biblical precedence for why it can't happen in this church as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that the spirit of this church is not, let's try harder. I pray the spirit of our church is resting in the promises of the good news of Jesus Christ. That we would allow you, the Holy Spirit, to take the promises of the gospel and bring them to our heads and hearts and apply them to our lives every single day. And Lord, we're going to kind of leave the rest up to you. We want to be an attractive and compelling community not just because we try hard, but because the Spirit of God is doing something really, really significant in the life of the church. We'd be able to look back and say, only God can do that. We do pray that you, Lord, would add to our number daily those who are being saved, not just because we want to grow to be a bigger church, but we want to see more and more people find joy, peace, and purpose as they find and follow after Jesus. Jesus, your good news for us, your good news for the whole world, And help us to never forget that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.